My name is Alan Riley, and I'm a video artist and educator uh, based in Brooklyn. Um, I'm a member of Death by Audio Arcade, a not-for-profit organization uh, that supports the creation of independent arcade games. Um, and we specialize in uh, creating unique physical implementations of digital games. Um, uh, yeah, we're, we're based out of a venue called Wonderville that's also in Brooklyn. Um, it's an indie arcade bar that opened uh, last year. And uh, with Death by Audio, I built this arcade cabinet um, called Video Freak, which uh, you can play here in the indie arcade and uh, also at this panel. Um, uh, so this panel is about Video Freak, this, this game, um, but it's also about the relationship between video games and a uh, domain of video art called video synthesis uh, that um, come together in Video Freak. Um, video synthesis involves the physical manipulation of video signals to create visual patterns on a screen. Um, we're going to start by um, looking at how Video Freak works and um, how the project got started. And um, we'll cover the common history that video games and, and video um, art share and explore what, this, re what relevance this has to um, gaming and game design. Um, then uh, my intent is for us to go over the basic techniques of video synthesis using um, this AV cart full of mixers and, and video tools and these uh, Nintendo Entertainment systems. Um, but uh, we might, you might need to help me tinker a little bit later on to get that working. Um, so, but we'll start with some stuff about Video Freak. So this is a picture of Video Freak. Oh, I should also say, so during this, these slides, I'm incorporating some video synthesis imagery that I created, um, not in the context of Video Freak, but just as part of my work as a video artist. Um, so um, yeah, Video Freak is a video art arcade game. It combines the gameplay of a vertical shoot 'em up with the physical analog electronics of a video synthesizer. Um, I designed the game and the electronic system, and the physical wooden cabinet was designed and produced by Mark Kleback and Nick Santinello um, from Death by Audio Arcade, and the cabinet artwork was done by the artist Tim Fight. Um, the title of Video Freak is a reference to the 1960s and 70s video art collective Video Freaks. Uh, who are essential to the development of video as a medium of expression and help to create a movement in participatory media that continues to resonate today. So this is what's inside of Video Freak. Um, we can take a look at this in person later on. Um, so playing the game involves uh, manipulating live analog video signals um, using some um, knobs, potentiometers that are connected to some of this equipment and are available for the player on the control panel. Um, and so it's sort of a, it's a unique um, piece of hardware. You know, it's a, it's a unique hardware implementation of a game. Um, it can only be played on this specific arcade cabinet. There is only one copy. Um, the gameplay is inspired by, um, I can show you some of how this looks in, in action. Um, the gameplay is inspired by um, other vertical shmups, um, particularly manic shmups like Donanpachi, um, but also games like Raiden. Um, it's, it's meant to have the feel of a manic shmup, but um, just in terms of the physics, like there's a second button that allows you to slow down your movement while playing. But the actual gameplay is very minimal and um, there's no end to the game. It, 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 it's really intended to emphasize the, the, um, the connection between the player's movements and the, the visual effects. Um, Video Freak also includes um, a, an installation of video art on CRT monitors like, like these um, that 
I've installed in different ways over the different occasions that I've had to exhibit the game. Um, and so this is an example of, of some of that. Uh, and it, it off, I like to incorporate live color video feed of the game, like in, integrate that in with the, the pre-recorded video art. Um, and uh, I've, in, in certain situations, I've also incorporated additional video mixers and it's kind of set up a situation where players can also kind of mix the, the signal even more and uh, kind of understand more directly some of the technology behind the game. So um, just a little bit about what is inside of Video Freak and, and how it works. Um, the game is actually built in Unity and it runs on a Windows machine. Um, and uh, that, uh, the, the video signal from the, the computer, from the PC, uh, gets converted in, from VGA into composite video and then gets r r routed through the, the, um, the patch that you see inside the console. Um, so the first step is a um, VGA to composite video converter. Um, and I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about the video signal a little bit later on, but um, you know, VGA is broken up into multiple wires where different elements of the signal are, are in different wires, whereas composite video is called composite because it has the, the, the picture information, the sync information, and you know, the whole video signal is in the, that one wire. Um, the, the signal then goes from the, the VGA output into a video mixer, similar to, to these. Um, uh, this is called a Videonics MX Pro. I think they were made in around 2000, 2001, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, they're meant for, um, you know, this, and what's special about this is that it allows you to, uh, you know, cut between different video signals, mix and blend and, and do different kind of fancy uh, wipe patterns and, and chroma keys and other kinds of video techniques um, that you can't just do by like plugging wires into different inputs on a VCR or something. Um, so uh, it was designed to do stuff like this. This is from the, uh, the tutorial video. Um, but, uh, you know, we are applying the tool in a different way, repurposing the tool. Uh, the, the next step in the, the video process here is this box, which is a color processor. And this is a tool that's like, you know, it's built into a lot of TVs, actually. Um, it, it's just for changing the brightness and the hue and the contrast. Uh, it's, it's called the Archer um, Super Video Processor. and. Um, after, after the signal goes through here, it goes back into the, the Videonics mixer as the second channel. And then all of the, the feedback um, that takes place and these like visual patterns in Video Freak are um, arising from a, um, a feedback loop that results from that patch. So uh, just to go over it again, um, the uh, signal starts at the, the PC, which is not pictured, then goes into the, the converter box then goes into the Videonics and um, goes back into the color processor and then back into the Videonics. And this creates this feedback loop and, um, that you see on the CRT. Um, but you, know, you, can, you could use any sort of video signal. You can use Nintendo Entertainment Systems or another gaming console or cameras and other devices to create a feedback loop like this. So this is kind of the, the elemental basic building block of this kind of video synthesis work. It's a self-oscillating assemblage of, of video tools. <laughs> so, um, Oh, and I, I just want to emphasize that, like, in that, so a, a detail about the design of the, the like, electronic system in Video Freak 
is that the, the Archer box is pictured on the right of the console here, and then the, um, the, the potentiometer is the control panel that is above it is, is like, you know, those, those controls are attached to the color box. So you're actually shaping the, the space of the feedback by, you know, adjusting, basically adjusting the brightness and hue of the, the video signal as it's being fed back through the mixer. Um. Cool. All right. So um, I, my introduction to this kind of um, artwork uh, came when I was a, a graduate student at the New York State College of Ceramics in Alfred, New, New York. And one of the, the special uh, features of this school is that they, they have a device called a Sandine image processor. And uh, that is this, this uh, video synth here. It's a, it's a modular synth, so it has a bunch of different um, tools that, are, um, that you can create patches with. And uh, it uh, was invented by this guy, Dan Sandine, who I think um, seems like he would be really into MAGFest uh, based on his cool hat. And I realized when I was making this um, presentation that I should have done this in Dan Sandine cosplay. <laughs> This is from a, a tutorial video that he made for the, the Sandine image processor. So um, this is just a clip of a recording that I made um, using this tool more recently. When I went back, they have a residency program at this school called the Institute for Electronic Arts. Um, and so this, this, it's, it's a multi-purpose video art tool. And, and I'm showing this just to, to list these basic elements of video synthesis. So there's feedback which we talked about, which is a kind of oscillation. Um, there's, there's you know, other kinds of oscillation, like, like gen signal generators, oscillators, um, that in video art kind of generally make bars in the screen, kind of what, like what you're seeing here. Um, mixing, like what the, the, the Videonics does. Um, the cool thing about a video synth like the Sandine is that you can put in multiple video signals and then use a control voltage to, um, to like, control the rate at which it's editing between two signals. So you can make some pretty interesting stuff with that. Um, but in 2010, when I first encountered this device, um, I, uh, the first thing that I thought to, to do with it is to um, run some Super Mario World into it. Now, I'm once again not hearing the audio here, but that's okay. Unless I can do something with this, but it's all right. Um, so this is a pretty low-res video, but it actually looks OK on the projector. But yeah, um, I, I made these recordings with uh, my friend Michael, who was playing Mario while I was trying to learn how to use the Sandine image processor. Um, and uh, you know, I like to speculate that maybe I was attracted to doing this because of the amount of time that I spent staring close to the CRT scan lines before I, uh, my parents realized that I needed glasses. Um, so, I, so later on, a few years after um, initially encountering this tool, I, I did a residency at this place called the Lower East Side Ecology Center Gowanus E-Waste Warehouse in Brooklyn. And they have this massive collection of e-waste and then they're always getting stuff in. Part of the residency is that you can experiment with anything that comes into the space and um, teach workshops and things like that. So I kind of got back into the video game, video art practice, sort of um, building assemblages of mixers and video game consoles and inviting um, friends and the public to come in and kind of play games through through these systems. It set up a bunch of, of CRTs and multiple instances of the same game and things like that. So um, what that ends up looking like is, you know, in this case with Super Mario Brothers, uh, you know, it's really perfect for running through a video mixer because you can blue screen out the blue sky and then have two instances of the game going. But right there with that, that kind of color wash, there is the really typical video feedback um, effect from the patch that we looked at before. So all of this um, led me to wonder, you know, video games and video synthesis 
Both are about manipulating you know, visual video signals on a screen using some kind of interface. And just seeing people playing um, this game while also playing with the mixers made me wonder about if there's any kind of history that connects these um, tools together. And so I want to talk a little bit uh, about that too um, and share, just share some kind of historical information. Um, what I have found is that uh, it turns out that both video games and video synthesis um, emerged from a, in the mid 20th century as expressions of a uh, interdisciplinary uh, movement in systems theory called cybernetics. And um, this term cybernetics was introduced by a mathematician named Norbert Wiener in a 1948 book called Cybernetics, or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. The core idea of cybernetics is that everything in nature um, can be understood as a system. And um, Yeah, and that everything that, that happens is a result of an exchange of information between systems. And uh, what's notable about this idea is that it, is, it was meant to be applied universally. So in cybernetics, anything could be understood this way as a system. Um, any type of system can exchange information with any other type of system. So, um, you know, th that means like, You know, information could be exchanged between people. It could be exchanged between a virus and a host. It could be exchanged among different species of animals or um, between people and electronic systems. Um, so when I first encountered this idea articulated this way, I had a hard time understanding it because it seemed very obvious or I, I didn't understand that there was a time when people did not think that way. And that's because um, I live in a cybernetic culture and um, have been cybernated. <laughs> um, but this, this kind of cybernetic thinking, um, oh yeah, and, and then this is an example from um, cybernetics of a, uh, of a cybernetic loop, which is very similar to a feedback loop. Um, so it's a whole philosophy based on feedback. So there's a, what's called, you know, in this case, it's a, a controller, something that's taking action on a, a, on a system, sending information to that system. That system responds and sends, uh, f that response as feedback to some kind of sensor and that's taken up by the controller and then that affects the future action toward that system. Um, so it, it's sort of like, a con it's a conceptual framework that can be applied to any kind of situation. But having this conceptual framework in mind um, allows us to reconsider the functionality of things that may have been designed for a particular purpose. So for example, and I'm wondering if we'll have audio here, you know, the computers already existed when cybernetics was developed as a concept, but, you know, and not necessarily as a result of people reading that book, but maybe as part of just the general um, emergence of this way of thinking and culture, people started to realize that you can do lots of different things with computers other than calculate, making calculations for um, you know, ballistics trajectories and things like that. So, for example, you know, creating electronic music. This is a, a music program for the, the PDP-1 computer, um, and which also was used in uh, 1962 to create Space War, which is one of the earliest video games that gets mentioned a lot. Um, although I, I kind of suspect that there are probably hundreds of examples of games like this that, that were created in different contexts where people were tinkering with computers and creating custom interfaces that changed the functionality of the computer. So, an indie arcade cabinet. <laughs> the first video game was an indie arcade cabinet. <laughs> now this is kind of cool. Uh, 
there were also lots of programs that were written to create kind of chaotic vector graphics visualizations. So um, this is kind of interesting. Repurposing the tool. So um, this kind of cybernetic context and cybernetic um, way of thinking also uh, inspired some research that was uh, done for the US government by uh, Douglas Engelbart on um, ways that we could use cybernetic systems to transform how humans think. And that was published in this, this text, Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework, which also was written in 19, or published in 1962. Um, the result of this research came several years later in the form of this NLS prototype, which is a um, prototype of an interactive kind of Windows-based computer system, and was the, it, it's often kind of referenced as the, the, the source of all of the kind of computer, you know, interfaces that we use now. Is this the one that's in the mother of all demos? Yes, it is. So um, this, this, uh, this prototype was kind of, um, was sh shared with the public uh, th in the form of these live video demos where they um, really kind of amazingly demonstrated uh, some functionality, really advanced functionality that would only be implemented in a widespread way more recently, like collaborative document editing at a distance, uh, video chat, <laughs> and um, but also introduced right. the mouse. The first novel thing here is the device at my right that controls the pointing by which I point to things displayed on the screen and communicate to the computer that that's of significance to me. And it's a fairly simple device that at the bottom has a couple of wheels, one that's oriented crossways. So I'm not, I, I'm not sure how, if you can hear that very clearly, but he's explaining um, what it means to point at something with a mouse. Of the spot. And it's also in the same paragraph explaining how it physically work works. The way they roll or slide that the horizontal one will rotate really. And also in the same, around the same time, uh, I'm a little bit confused about the dates, honestly, on, on this next topic. Um, but in the late 60s, this, this actually, this presentation here is from 1969. There were earlier presentations as well, but this, this is a 1969 demo. So around the same time, you know, it says 68 here. Um, but the, this this is a patent from 1971 for uh, video games. This is for the uh, the this is the Ralph Bear patent is considered one of the early you know original patents for video, commercial video games, um, which is called the Television Gaming and Training Apparatus, um, which it's kind of interesting. Uh, the intention of video games is a method by means of which standard television receivers can be utilized as active rather than passive instruments. So this is kind of an interestingly broad goal for video games. It gets more specific um, in terms of like, you know, discussing actual games, but I just think that's sort of a interesting expression. And then an example of this video game prototype. So here's just a, you know images of all these different interfaces that were prototyped as cybernetic tools for interacting with electronic systems um, for sharing information between a human and an electronic system. Um, they're, they're all ways of kind of manipulating the, fee the a feedback loop between ourselves and the electronic system. So a, a, another kind of historical um, uh, parallel that is happening while all of this kind of feedback prototyping was, cybernetic prototyping um, was happening, uh, was the emergence of video art as a, a, like a medium of, of art. Um, one of the, the major figures in video art is Namjoon Paik. Um, uh, who actually uh, began his career as a, a composer and, and musician, um, but then began uh, creating these um, prepared pianos by, you know, like physically modifying the piano, connecting with lots of other interesting, um, equ you know, equipment and just like a, there's a telephone and 
uh, you know, a lot of other interesting stuff in there. So um, it's it's uh, a repurposing of, of a, a familiar instrument to have some other purpose, you know, to make different sounds and to also like mean something different. Um, uh, and several years after this, this is from 1958, and uh, starting in the early 60s, uh, Paik started to collaborate with an engineer named Shuya Abe, and they started to apply that same kind of repurposing methodology to television sets by um, doing things like putting magnets on top of them, and um, Paik also collaborated with uh, an artist named Charlotte Mormon to create a cello that had television sets embedded in it. And um, they did performances where um, she would play the cello in, in partnership with an audience. So this kind of participatory uh, video methodology was formalized by Paik as a practice that he called um, participation TV. And he made a, a series of different video installations that he called participation TV, um, but they all kind of had this element of people coming up and encountering a, a video system and um, having a way to manipulate what was happening on the screen. So this is an example of one of those. who was working in this uh, domain. Uh, Stana Vasulka is another Im important video artist who invented many tools and approaches to creating video art. Um, for example, this series of pieces called Violin Power, where she was using uh, a violin with an electric pickup to uh, control a, um, a video mixer similar to the Sandy image processor. What does this all have to do with video games? Well, what this all has to do with video games is that repurposing a $120,000 computer that was designed to do you know, business or military calculations to play ping pong or play Bach or make grocery lists is um, a similar kind of gesture to um, you know, installing TVs in a cello or, you know, putting a magnet on a television. Um, I think there's a, there's, a cons there's a common kind of cybernetic prototyping methodology um, between video games, computers, and this kind of participatory um, art. So, in a sense, you know, video games are invented in, in this kind of act of generative uh, destruction. So what I'm interested in doing is identifying and celebrating this practice. Um, so 
That's the, uh, the historical scope of this panel. Thank you for taking that journey. Um, so I, I uh, wanted to just talk a little bit about the video signal and then look at um, some of the, the hardware here and, um, and maybe play some video games. Uh, so first, just really, really quickly, um, analog and digital. Analog is a continuous signal. It's a physical vibration or in, you know, in, in nature. Um, digital is, is sort of a symbolic representation of, of, of that. Um, so like the, one of the most common ways of thinking about this uh, is, is that, you know, in, is sampling. So, you know, if, if the analog signal is some waveform that is you know, moving continuously, um, a digital version of that would be sampling it at a certain frequency, um, and the, in each of those samples would have a specific number. Um, the the video signal is similar to an audio waveform, but the difference is that it is um, in that it's like a, a physical you know vibration that is um, expressing the image that the camera is sensing. Um, but the the major difference is that. Uh, video has a has a sync signal. So what you're seeing on the left here is um, what what it, what a video signal looks like when it's creating color bars. And so you see that little smaller um, bump in front of the bigger bump is the the sync signal. And this would and on that vector scope, it's um, that's a representation of two scan lines of the bar of the color bars. Um, oh, and yeah, well, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. But because of that sync signal, a, another important tool that I didn't mention before is a um, time-based corrector. Now, there, there isn't a time-based corrector in Video Freak because the mixer has one embedded in it, um, but these mixers don't. So um, if I were to try to capture uh, analog video um, feedback loop through like a, you know, um, a, a capture card or something, I would need to send it through something like this, um, which uh, takes the, the video signal and corrects the sync. So you can see that the sync on the left is kind of blobby and the sync on the right is more um, defined. And so that, that's what the, like a, a digital capture card is gonna be looking for because it's sampling the video signal. If the sync doesn't happen where it expects it to happen, it just won't do anything. So another important concept in video synthesis is just, you know, the video is made up of scan lines. There are, um, it refreshes at 60 hertz. So if you send a 60 hertz signal into a monitor, it will show one bar. And if you send a 120 hertz signal into a monitor, it'll show two bars. Um, I think I had some audio here. So, you know, we already looked at internal mixer feedback is another important structure um, or, you know, structural element of video synthesis. And then there's also camera feedback, which we didn't really talk about, but this is just an example of that. Um, and also keying, which we looked at earlier. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the keying is subtractive. It removes parts of the video signal. Um, so you can kind of have other bursts of feedback em emerging through. And um, just to talk about this, oh, never mind. I forgot to plug in my um, computer before this panel, but um, but that's okay because that was pretty much the end of the the whole talking part. But it was a really cool image that I wanted to tell you about because it, it's like it uses all of these methods in one moment. Um, but uh, yeah, so just hold that into your mind. So. Well, I, 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 um, this is the, actually, this is a good transition into the tinkering portion of this panel. Um, so I think we do have a, a charger in that tote bag, but is that, is that there? Maybe it's not. I have all these other cables. No, I think that, so, so now what, what um, and in terms of recording the panel and, and all that, I'm not sure how this works because I don't have like a, 
a lav mic, but um, you know, so we'll just we're gonna make this more personal now. Um, but do you have any questions about uh, any of what we just looked at? Yes. Is video art in Europe and the UK different because of the 50 hertz signal? Is there like a difference in messaging at all? That's a really good question, and I would assume that that specific fact would be different in PAL formats. Oh, nice. I have, but I have a MagSafe 2 computer. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I haven't upgraded this computer because I um, I have a really ancient, unfinished Final Cut Pro 7 project on it. So it's like, so um, yeah. Any other questions about anything that we just went over? Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, I don't. I mean, it would be kind of interesting if you like, in terms of like what you can do with a, a digital signal is analog when it's going through a cable. It's like a. It's an organization of analog, you know, pulses of electricity into a pattern that represents information. So, for example, I have another project that we didn't look at today that involves running an Ethernet cable into guitar pedals, and you can hear that. And the, like when you load a website, it makes um, sound. So, it, it, it's just a you know, di digital is an organizational principle for electricity. Um, but for you know, for the purpose of this game, I, I chose to make it all analog effects. Um, because just of the, the you know the premise of kind of combining these two domains together of digital games and analog synthesis. Yes. It can be used on flat screens, and um, it can also be used on projectors. And it's because the hardware for displaying video signals, especially when you're talking about an SD, like standard definition NTSC video, that's just a, that's a modulation scheme for, for the signal. So more contemporary tools like flat screens and projectors are built to, to play that signal back. Um, but they're, you know, they, they may have elements where they're, they're not like, there's not an electron gun and a CRT in them necessarily. It's like, um, actually, in the case of the projector, I, I, there is a tube, right? So, but they're, they're, it's probably converting the signal into a digital image and then displaying it. I'm using these CRTs because they do have a. They're they're brighter and more rich for this kind of imagery and. Um, they just look really cool, and you can stack them on top of each other. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's good exercise to move them. <laughs> uh, so, any other, yeah? Where would you go if I get it monitored in particular? So now these are like more like security camera style monitors. Yeah. So they're, yeah, they're either made for security cameras or, um, or, you know, the, some of them were made for editing video using a videonics mixer or something like that. Yeah. So uh, you can, the, the, the places to find them are either eWaste or Craigslist, you know, the, just the sort of the typical places. Um, I know that there's at least one place that kind of specializes in renting out these kinds of monitors, but like the really nice ones for art, art shows and stuff like that. But yeah. Mm hmm. Any other questions? Yeah? As, uh, as time goes on, these kind of CRTs kind of go away. Is there any kind of effort to preserve that or kind of like reproduce it maybe or make new kind of CRTs? Yeah, I don't know of anyone who's doing that. There's this one place in um, Manhattan called CTL Electronics, and um, they um, uh, worked with Namjoon Paik to install and all of his work at you know MoMA and stuff and continue to do service on his work um, 
replacing tubes and things like that. But in I think it's in Trenton, New Jersey, they just did a big um, refurbishing of a, of a Namjoon Paik installation in the town and then downtown, and they did use uh, flat screens in that case. So some I think some of this work is being kind of trans translated into a different medium. But I I mean it's it's it, it doesn't need to be about like the purity of of what what um yeah how authentic the equipment is it's it's more about the the organizing principle of this like cybernetic feedback loop in the resulting imagery um and you know uh something that i i had intended on on showing you um is just that there, there there's some interesting things happening with um you know, software-based tools that can can work in this this um, medium. Uh, th there's a person named Andre J who's creating a tool called Wave Pool and Video Waves that are um, open frameworks tools for video synthesis, and um, they're all kind of based on the underlying mathematical concepts that produce the kinds of imagery that you see in video synthesis. So. Um, they're they're really it, in a sense it's a simulation, but it's it's not because it's just that phenomena happening. It's that phenomenon happening mathematically in a digital space, and it looks great. I, I think there is, but it, what's kind of interesting is is that that context and that history, which was very prominently uh, represented here last year, and it was really cool, um, it I don't think has really been there hasn't been work done to connect it into this kind of video art history and computer history that I was covering, and I think that's really important. Um, there's a book that w came out last year called People's History of Computing in the United States that has this mission of um, kind of uh, trying to capture more of the stories of, of things that people were creating in you know, communities that weren't necessarily being exhibited at museums like, like you know, video artists like Namjoon Paik and things like that. So I think that it is in terms of the, the underlying ideas um, but but the history hasn't fully been inter intertwined yet. All right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's 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 likely that very similar tools were used. A lot of this stuff was w these methods were kind of found their way into pop culture in the '70s. You know, like Todd Rundgren had a, a, a video synthesizer called a Hearn Video Lab and used that to make music videos and things like that. And and like you know, it was like there's a lot of video feedback and Soul Train and things like that, like TV shows with music and. Um, so it it, it, it it like had it had a, a, a place in in like a popular vocabulary, definitely. Um, so as I talked earlier today about the Yeah. Um, I was wondering or in that conversation, um, the panelists and audience were talking about how important it is to
Yeah, it does. I mean, for me personally, what's what's relevant um, is is its connection to this kind of broader ecosystem of how we think in relation to the technological tools that we use. Um, so it's it's like there's a there's a kind of like distancing effect when you have a. It, it, I I guess okay. What what I think is really important about this is that we use. We all kind of use similar digital electronic devices all the time. We have routines around doing that. And um, I think it's very healthy to have experiences that implement um, kind of digital methods and electronic methods in different physical forms. And that this kind of um, what I was calling, you know, prototyping, the cybernetic prototyping that's expressed through, uh, you know, a, a computer mouse or a phone. Um, is should continue to be expressed through new forms and new kind of prototypes that um, you know I think it's healthy for the mind now whether I, I would say it like that in a uh, art proposal I'm, I'm not sure but it's kind of based on the context I guess you know <laughs> that's not a great answer Yeah, I think I mean I think it would be really cool to to um, have a, a VR game that has video synthesis analog signals coming into it. And the other the other thing is, um, you know, Video Freak. It's like the 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 digital signal of the game goes into an analog system, but then it doesn't get re-digitized. Like the 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 video feedback has a, has meaning to the player, but it doesn't have meaning back to the game. And I think that would be kind of interesting and and powerful. To, to, to do something with that, like to either um, use a capture card and do something with that, or, in, or like even just having an Arduino sample the, you know, the, um, the, the, the signal or some element of the signal and do something with that, or having like a photo cell on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that brings us to the, the uh, end of the question and answer portion of the time. Uh, okay, so so now uh, we should play some video games. So yeah, if, if you haven't had a chance to check out Video Freak yet, it's here. Um, we can open up the, the lid and take a look at the stuff inside too if you wanted to check that out in the last few minutes of our time here. Um, so go forth and uh, create some interesting uh, prototypes. Yeah. Prototype art. <laughs>